So just an extremely quick refresher of what the the uh, what MCMC is. So it's a way of sampling, getting dependent samples from a target distribution. Where here I've used the notation fx is the target distribution that you know up to a normalizing constant. Uh, you provide a transition kernel Q, which proposes new jumps, uh, given where you are now. And then with probability alpha, you accept a new jump, and that becomes your next sample from the chain. Uh, or with probability 1 minus alpha, you stay exactly where you are, and your output gets a, a repeated value inside it. So, and to, today I wanted to look at the sort of the theory of what's going on, why this actually works. So, with the with this kind of Markov chain, if 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 we're only working in one dimension, then this definition here works as a definition of what is a Markov chain. So, any stochastic process that has the Markov property, so that is, if you ask some probability about this process at time n, and you've been given the history of the process, all from time zero up to time n minus one, then the only thing that you need to know is what happened in the in the last time step. So this probability is probability x n is less than or equal to x, given x n minus one, what that value is. Uh, so. A lot of the examples we'll be doing, the chain that we'll be sampling is not one dimensional, it's two or three or multi dimensional. So I can't, the, the definition looks a bit uglier in, in uh, the high dimensions because you can't just say some vector, you know, one, two is less than a number five, it just doesn't make sense. So the way they say it, they, they write it as the probability that Xn is inside some region A, some multi dimensional region, given. Uh, the vector values history of the process is again the, the, the same thing the, the conditional it's the same as the conditional probability of being inside that space given just time what happened in the very last time step where these are all vectors so because uh, writing this vector notation is a bit disgusting, especially my handwriting is hard enough to get simple things written on the screen. So, uh, and to simplify what, what's going on here, we'll just write x1, x2, even if it's a, referring to just a single number or a, or a vector. And we'll say that they take values inside a state space, which is this curly S. And you can think of that as either being just the, the real numbers for the simple case, or the the, the n-dimensional real numbers. Okay, so if we have a Markov chain, what is its transition kernel, and and what does that actually mean for, in terms of uh, densities and uh, conditional densities? So if we look at the density of the, the chain at time xi conditioned on the time at xi minus 1. So maybe you've seen this notation before. That's the probability that xi is inside the range of y plus a small delta y. Uh, this infinitesimally small interval given i minus 1 takes the exact value of little x. So the definition of this p of y given x is exactly this thing here. So this is the transition of p of y given x. Uh, so for, for all i, i equals 1, 2, and so on. So 
In particular, that means uh, if you take this thing p of y, given x, and you fix some specific x, and you integrate over the first argument, well then you're integrating over a probability density function, and that thing has to sum up to 1. So this, that's what this integral here is, it integrate over the state space. Oh, okay, I guess that's a bit tricky. So in, in say, two dimensions, this integral over the state space is really a, a double integral over you know the vector y1 y2 given the vector x1 x2 dy1 dy2 okay so our proof of uh, the MCMT algorithm actually working is relying on these uh, stationary distributions then some Markov chains, if you let them, if you start the first value randomly from this distribution pi, if you have the behavior that then the next value is also, if you just run it forward one step and, and look at the distribution of that, and it happens to be the same distribution and over and over again for infinity, then that means this pi is a stationary distribution for the Markov chain. And so we, remember we want to create a Markov chain where the stationary distribution is the target that we want to sample from f of x. So uh, in the last time I wrote this definition I actually had some, some error here. I'd, each time I'd written a conditional thing. I'd written x1 conditioned on x0 was pi distributed. That's not exactly correct. So, I've up, I've updated the slides uh, for I think the last lecture to, to remove that. But so, what is this this uh, implication here? What does it actually mean in terms of density functions? So, the density of the Markov chain at time one, you can connect that to its past by looking at the joint density of time x0, x1. Uh, let me just change something. Okay. If you have the joint density of x0, x1, and you integrate over uh, the x0, then that has the same value. So if you read it right to left, you're just integrating out x0 from the joint density. And then this joint PDF can be rewritten in terms of a conditional density. So conditional density of the first one given the zeroth uh, value and then that has to be multiplied by just the univariate density of the zeroth one. So remember this first part here is exactly the transition kernel P of Y given X that we had in the previous slide. So you can write the distribution of the Markov chain at time one to be the integral over p of x1 given x0 multiplied by the density of x0 like so. So this is a general fact of Markov chains not relating to stationary distributions. But you notice if uh, if we if we have a stationary distribution which is pi, then we can sort of plug in the values here. We can we can say and another way to say that pi is the stationary distribution is to say the density at time one has to be the integral over 
the transition kernel and then say we start in pi so then f the density of f of x naught will be pi pi of x naught so that integral if that is also distributed as pi then this is sort of an equivalent way of stating of, of uh, stating that the pi density is a stationary distribution for the Markov chain. Okay, so this is related to. Okay, so remember the the practical side of this is that. We can't really ever sample from the stationary distribution of our Markov chain, Monte Carlo um, Markov chain. But what we're using the fact is that if you run this chain for a large amount of time, capital N approximately equals infinity amount of time, then that that distribution is more or less converged to the stationary distribution that we want. So I wrote previously this line here so that uh, the distribution of the nth value given you start in some spe specific location converges to pi regardless of whatever specific location you started in. Uh, that means pi is a limiting distribution and I think this part here I've just written a bit written the same thing a bit more formally just saying if you look at the conditional densities and push them out the end into infinity. Uh, that's what that exactly means. Okay, so the the reason that we get uh, the Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm samples from our target is because we've built the target distribution into the alpha, this acceptance probability. Otherwise, the, the MCMC algorithm has no idea what target you're, you're trying to sample from. It all comes into, uh, comes into the algorithm just because of the, the specific way that alpha has been set up. And so to, to describe why this alpha works so well, um, I need to introduce yet another Markov chain concept called reversibility. So if you have a Markov chain with this transition kernel and it's reversible with respect to a density G, that means that you have G of X uh, transition between X to Y equals G of Y transition from y to x. Yep. For all x, y pairs inside your state space. So this has some fancy name that the detailed balance equations, but uh, intuitively what it means is if you were to, you have some Markov chain that's uh, reversible, and if you were to run it forward in time and look at the, the uh, trace plot, like you, you plot at time on the x-axis and the value it takes on the y-axis. If you if you plot it forward, and then you run a different Markov chain and you plot it backwards in time, you flip time around. You shouldn't be able to tell the difference between which one was running forward and which one was running backwards. So it's that's what it means to be reversible. It's sort of in time, the forward behavior is identical in distribution to the the, revert, the backwards behavior. So. This part is, is a bit disgusting, but uh, so remember, not every single Markov chain has a stationary distribution. The, the ones, the ones we're looking at, we're forcing it to have a stationary distribution. Um, and then you can have Markov chains which have a sta stationary distribution which are not reversible with respect to that. But luckily, luckily, luckily for the next slide. If you have a Markov chain and you know it's with uh, reversible with respect to some 
distribution G, then the Markov chain has a dis stationary distribution and G is the stationary distribution. So how do we prove this? So this is just rewriting the definition for what is uh, stationarity, sorry, reversibility with respect to G. Uh, and then we want to show that G has to be uh, a stationary distribution. So if we start off in G, then the next step will also be distributed as G. So how, does, how do we proceed? So we want to look at the distribution of X1 and we know just from moments ago this general fact that that is the integral over the, the distribution of the starting value multiplied by the transition kernel uh, P of x1 given x0 I just might explain there's sort of an intuitive way to read this integral so basically the only the, the probability of getting x1 is the probability of starting in x0 and then from x0 going to x1 for, for all the different so you look at all the different ways you could have gotten the value of x1 and all those different ways relate to starting in all the different x0 values you could have started in and then from there transitioning to x1 so it's kind of if you think about all the sample parts of the of the chain these these equations kind of make a bit more intuitive sense okay so how do we simplify this integral so we want to show that g is a stationary distribution so we'll say this first part to be true we'll say that x0 has the distribution g so this part can just become g of x0 p of x1 given x0 okay so now we have some kind of equation where we can use the reversibility and we've got something with g times p and uh, at the, at the, up there and, and the same thing down here so if we plug in the reversibility equation where here x becomes x0 and y becomes x1 well that means we can effectively switch x1 and x0 in this equation okay so how has that helped sorry exactly more so the first part can come out of the integral g of x1 because we're integrating over x0 and now we have the integral over x0 given x1 And can anyone tell me what this integral? Sorry? Yes, yes, exactly. So that for every transition kernel, sort of by definition, if you integrate over the first part, you're integrating over a density, so you're gonna add up to one. So so what are we showing? If you have G which is reversible and you start your Markov chain in a random location distributed according to G then you push forward one step then the variable x1 is also distributed as G 
And so you could do this over and over again you, and, and say at the if you if the i x i is distributed g then you know by the same argument x i plus one is distributed g so g is the stationary distribution to this chain. So that's a beautiful kind of proof. It's only a few lines. So how does how does that help? Well, Oh, this could be awkward. Okay. So, the final thing we want to show is that uh, f of x, our target, is the stationary distribution. So, to get that, we enforce that the Markov chain is reversible with respect to the target distribution f of x. And because of the previous result, if it's reversible with respect to f of x, then the Markov chain is has a stationary distribution, which is the target f of x. So uh, to start off, we have to look at when we run Markov chain Monte Carlo and we look at the output of that algorithm, what is the transition kernel for that? And it's, it's actually different. It's different to the Q transition kernel that we plug into it because the transition kernel we plug into it, um, oh, sorry, I should say it the other way. The transitions of the, of the output, uh, not all of them are accepting the proposals. So some transitions uh, don't happen effectively. So I'll just write this in math. I'm obviously not explaining it in words very well. So the transitions from x to y the rate at which they happen is related to the rate at which we propose going from x to y multiplied by the probability that we actually accept the jump from x to y. So it's actually q multiplied by alpha. And on the other hand, the, the way that you get uh, a transition from x to x is by proposing a change from, sorry, a jump to some other location y and then rejecting that jump. And then all the different ways, all the different proposals that you could have made y, you integrate over them and that gives you a probability of going from x to x. So when you propose points using Q, you get, uh, and you use the alpha that is in the metropolis hastings algorithm, you get this transition kernel P, and this thing is reversible with respect to uh, the target density F of X. Okay. So here's the big proof for MCMC, proof that I guess this uh, this really should be alpha. The alpha probability makes the chain reversible with respect to our target. And mm -hmm. I've just copied the definition here for the acceptance probability alpha x y, and then the same thing just with the arguments reversed. Okay. So. If, uh, What do we have? So this is uh, the thing we're trying to prove, reversibility with respect to our target, given this p, p value. Uh, we can skip the case where x equals y, because you plug that into the reversibility equation, it's just true by default. So for every other situation, what do we have? Um, f of x, p of y given x. So as noted in the previous slide, this p of y given x 
is actually the rate the transition kernel Q of our proposals multiplied by our acceptance probability of accepting a jump from X to Y. So just massage my computer again, change some settings, hopefully it doesn't crash. There you go. So if we plug in the definition here of alpha, then we have this is the minimum of the target density at y, the transition from y to x, and then the same thing but with x and y switch. Yeah? In the previous line, we have p x y equals q y x. We had p x y equals q y x. Alpha x y multiplied by alpha x y. And No, that's the, the same thing here. The P of Y given X is Q of Y given X multiplied by the alpha. Yeah. Now my pen has disappeared. Well, let's try. I'll just have to talk you through the the proof because my pen stopped working. So effectively, we were at this line here, where we had f of x, uh, the left-hand side of the reversibility uh, equation, and we plugged in p is actually q times alpha, and then again plugged in the definition for alpha. And so, if you just do a bit of um, algebra manipulating, if you the the minimum of two values which is then multiplied by something, is the same thing as the minimum of the, the inner things that have been multiplied. So if you effectively, if you bring this, this product here into both of the arguments for the minimum, that's what I've done here. So the, it cancels uh, with the denominator in the first part, and in the second part, multiplied by 1, it just uh, takes it in, in that second location. And the only trick here is just to multiply by 1, which is specifically chosen, to get something that looks like alpha of y, x. So if you look, this uh, minimum here is the same as this minimum here after we multiplied by that value. And so our conclusion is that we have the density at y given the transition from y to x and the probability of accepting a transition from y to x well that's exactly the transition p of the of the resulting markov chain and voila we've got uh, given given the specific way that we've um, suggested jumps 
the end uh, and the way that we are accepting some of them with alpha. Then we have reversibility of the chain with respect to our target density. Moments ago we proved that that means that the chain's stationary distribution is the target density. So um, now we have proofs. We finished all the proofs for this course. So what's the time? So maybe I'll, I'll ask you guys if you have questions related to the exam uh, because now I've actually written the exam uh, but I've forgotten exactly which questions I made you do although I'm very proud of some of them I, was, I thought uh, I was extremely proud of some of them not that that means they'll be very hard I don't I hope they're not very hard but you really need to know exactly uh, how a Markov chain works to get some of them for example so did you did you have any questions or for the first part of the report. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So for a lot of these topics, um, I gave you sort of the structure was I gave you an algorithm so, and then I gave you a quiz so that you would implement the algorithm and then I came back and explained gave some maps for why it works and so you haven't yet been assessed on that part of why any of this stuff works so you, I would expect uh, some of the smaller proofs that I've given in the class to be that you'd be able to understand and reproduce them so um, for example, there was a, a small proof related to um, the Kullback Leibler divergence being positive, and it took maybe four or five lines, and it used the fact that uh, you had uh, Jensen's inequality was the, the main step in the middle. That's the, the sort of the maximum length that I would expect you to to be able to reproduce in a in the quiz. This this proof is uh, the one that we just finished wherever it is. It's probably too long, the one. I, I probably wouldn't have asked you. Well, I didn't ask you to do one that big. But also just uh, some definition things. Uh, not like the definition of, uh, I didn't ask you to write down like Simpson's rule or anything like that, but, but other definitions from the beginning of the class and related to cross entropy. Would be, would be in there. So it will be until MCMC? Yes. Oh, well, I might just point out one last factor before going on to the quiz thing. Is one of the other reasons I wanted to give you some introduction to MCMC is because all of modern statistics is MCMC basically all of modern a lot of modern statistics uh, is this Bayesian statistic and the only way that you can actually evaluate anything you know, under that framework is is you have these densities that you don't know the normalizing constant for and you if you can <coughs> sample from those densities then you can answer all your statistical questions from there so uh, in the slides I, I won't go through them now but I've written some ex ex um, small example of what what a Bayesian way to to fit a distribution would be, uh, just having some data which is exponential, and then the the traditional way of doing statistics is, is well much simpler. But um, the Bayesian way, you can answer more interesting questions with that approach, and any. Uh, statistician would know how to do MCMC very well, I'll put it that way.